I think we're the most depressed we've ever been in history. You know, that's not a surprise when we live in this hush, hustle post-industrialist culture that's teaching you, yeah, you're nothing until you produce something. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. In today's episode, we're going to get a closer look at the journey to discovering your true self and living an authentic life. So we'll be touching on topics like manifestation, mindset, inner child healing, detaching productivity from your self-worth, and so much more. Our guest today is Samantha Chung. So Samantha, or Simplifying Sam, is a mindset and manifestation expert on a mission to help more people wake up and live fully as their authentic authentic self. It is her belief that we experience resistance, pain, and suffering when we ignore who we truly are. Her coaching style seeks to uncover and discover who you were before your limiting beliefs, conditions, and fears so that you can step into the most powerful version of yourself and attract anything. So here is Samantha Chung. Hello, Samantha. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. I am so happy to have you. How are you feeling? I'm feeling so good. Um, once good. again, I was just so grateful to hear that you were reaching out and um, excited to see what we could create. Yeah. Okay. So before we get into our story, I mean, I want to learn about your background. How did you become an expert in mindset, manifestation, and start sharing things on TikTok? Yeah. So that's a really good question. I actually haven't been sharing my manifestation journey or you know those tips for very long. Um, but my journey began about 10 years ago. I actually moved to New York City to pursue ballet as a professional. Wow. And um, that led That's to... That's incredible, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah. Sometimes when I tell that story, I'm always... I talk about it like it's no big deal because it's my life. And yeah. then other people are like, wait, 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 wait. You moved from Tennessee to New York when you were 18 to pursue ballet. And I was like, yeah, no big deal. Um, but it was a big deal. And I was really young and I had to grow up really fast. And I was, I came from a small town where I was sort of like the star of like the little mm -hmm. ballet school. Yeah. And then I moved to New York and I was just literally chewed up and spit out. But that journey and being in that crowd and environment led me down some really dark path, paths, uh, dark days. Um, I developed a lot of, you know, health disorders and, you know, eating disorders and just which led to mental disorder. Um, and so I ended up leaving ballet and going back home. And for the entire summer, I was just like, what am I going to do with my life? Wait, and what <laughs> and age was that? Like, how long were you in New York doing the thing? That was about two years. So I was 20 okay. when I moved yeah. back home. And uh -huh. that was obviously when my life was just beginning, but I yeah. literally thought my life was ending. I was like, oh I'm 20. Gosh. I'm back in my hometown. I left New York. I literally am going to hide and make sure no one sees me in public. And I was trying to, because I was trying to figure out how am I going to present myself to other people now? This identity crisis was kind of forming. And so um, I think one of those things always has to happen for you to, of course, uncover who you really are underneath that. Yeah. And that's kind of where that journey began. Um, my dad was actually always a really spiritual person because uh, in his late 30s, early 40s, he actually was diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. um, before that, he was quite a philosophical person. And by the way, he survived. <laughs> He's still awesome. alive. Amazing. Um, yeah, it's incredible. But um, he actually started seeking a lot of spiritual guidance during that time. You know, he was facing life and death and so started reading a lot of books and just questioning life and himself and, you know, how he may have created this, um, not to blame himself, but just, you know, take responsibility. Um, and so I remember I was having a particularly boring day that summer without, I had no job, I wasn't studying, and I just walked into our little study room. So he has a bunch of bookshelves there, and I never read that wasn't for school before this. And I don't know why, but now I know in retrospect that it was spirit moving me and getting me to do that. But I just saw this orange paperback book and I guess it really stood out to me visually. And so I was like, okay, I'm bored. I'm going to read that. And it was A New Earth by Eckhart Ooh, Tolle. Wow. Yeah. That's a deep and one. To start it's a with. deep one. Yeah. I'm going to be honest though. Definitely. I've read it twice now. And the yeah. second time I was like, Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, I didn't get all of this before, but it was enough just kind of start to get me thinking about 
my thoughts and my worldview. Um, so yeah, that was kind of where I started, but it didn't really settle in until my very late twenties because I grew up believing that I needed to really prove my worth, you know, prove that I was good enough to other people, but mainly to myself. And so out of a lot of fear and a lot of self-hatred, I achieved what externally looked very successful. Um, I became a multiple six-figure real estate entrepreneur in North America's most unaffordable city. Mm -hmm. Um, And outwardly, I looked like I really had it all. I figured it out so quickly. I made it to the Was top 10%. Was this near your hometown or did you move to start this I career? actually moved. I yeah. totally Where skipped a portion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I went to Vancouver. Go? Okay. I okay. went to Vancouver. Yeah. yeah. Um, after meeting my husband overseas in Europe um, and having a long distance relationship and then, yeah. Okay. So crazy. that led you to Vancouver and then you did started real estate. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, actually when I got to Vancouver, I spent a year um, working in retail I had Mm -hmm. no idea what I was going to do. I was a college graduate. I actually graduated from McGill University with this really great degree. And I didn't know what to do with it because I didn't go to school for me. I went to school to make myself look like I knew what I was doing um, so that my parents would be proud. Um, And so it wasn't really an aligned thing for me, but I did it. And then when I graduated, moved to, uh, moved to Vancouver, I thought, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I knew that what I had graduated in, which was linguistics, I didn't really want to do. Um, mm. I talked to a few people and there's a couple of different options you can kind of go down if you're on that route. And you could either become a field linguist and study a native language and transcribe it and find language patterns if you're nerdy like that. And, um, or you could go into speech therapy. Um, and so I thought, okay, well, I guess those are my only two options. Um, this is before I really learned to question what I believe is possible. And I thought, okay, those are the two options. So I decided to pursue speech therapy, but I was late applying to their graduate program. So for a year, I just literally volunteered. I worked in retail. And that was when I started really picking up a lot of the books and spiritual practices again, because I had time. Mm -hmm. Um, I started going back to yoga, but at that time I wasn't ready to really embody the practices. I remember learning about manifestation and being like, yes, I'm going to apply this and I'm going to, you know, learn all these tools. And on my journey, what I've really been able to learn is that your manifestation is going to be directly correlated to how willing you are to heal and question a lot of your unquestioned thoughts and beliefs. And so I wasn't ready to do that. Um, And so I applied to the program, the graduate program, and I remember when I got my non-admission letter, the letter that was telling me I didn't get in, Mm -hmm. I was so relieved. And that was the first time. Yeah. And that was the first time I started listening to my internal guidance system where I was like, that wasn't aligned. I remember Mm -hmm. I opened it and I was like- And how old were you at that point? I was 25. Okay. So yeah, from 20 when you- went back home to 25 is when you like kind of, you pivoted your direction in those years. And then this is kind of like another turning point. Definitely. Yeah. The turning point between 20 and 25 was really dissolving my identity as a dancer and then going back and being a student. Um, which was another one of my identities that's a whole that other I had story. been. Yeah. yeah, that's a whole other story. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then I took on that identity, of course, of being the perfect student and, yeah. um, you know, just wow. perfect everything, um, as us Asian elder daughters do. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, after graduating school, this was definitely the bigger pivot that I feel. Right. It was all part of the journey, right? But so you didn't get what into the school. And then, yeah, where did you, that lead you? Was it directly yeah. to real estate? So I didn't get into the school and um, for the entire summer, I continued working at retail. I literally made like $14 an hour selling shoes. And I actually remember thinking that I didn't hate it that much. And I was like, that's really scary because I'm not currently experiencing the pain of where I am. And unless you experience that pain of staying where you are, you won't move forward. And so I started creating painful scenarios in my mind where I was like, I'm 55 and I still sell (laughs) shoes for $14 an hour. And then I was like, no. Um, But for the summer, I just kind of honestly wandered around and just tried to figure out what I was going to do. And then I remember I came across one of my first, I guess, spiritual courses. Um, The algorithm found me or the universe sent it to me through spirit guides, but it was called the Lifebook Program. And um, this program was intended to get you to start thinking really consciously and intentionally about the life you wanted to create in the areas of career, relationship, you know, 
personal value, emotional life, um, financial life. And so it was like a two month program where I had to watch these modules. And I was really motivated because they said, if you finished the whole program and submitted your module homework, that you would get a refund. And so oh. I was, wow. I had no money back then. So I was like, yeah. yes, I'm going to do this program and I'm going to yeah. finish it. And then I'm going to get my refund. And, um, I ended up doing the program and it literally, that was the first time I started actually imagining what it would look like to live greater than how I was. I really believed at that time that this is just life. I guess you graduate from school and you just get kind of a shitty job and then make it work, (laughs) pay, you know, live paycheck to paycheck. Um, I hadn't really had any expanders in my life at that point. Um, But I started doing this program and started thinking about, okay, what would it look like if I actually, you know, had a million dollars? What would it look like if I actually really liked what I was doing and was excited about it and was helping people? And what would my relationships look like at the highest level? And so thinking about all of this and becoming really moved emotionally by this, of course, that's raising your vibration, right? And so then I started attracting different people and different opportunities into my life. And so one of those people was actually one of my closest friends in Vancouver, who was a realtor. And, um, she actually had a very comfortable lifestyle and I felt that she was actually quite glamorous, although that's not her personality. She's very down to earth, but you know, she had this kind of high flying job. She drove this really nice car. She was constantly closing deals. I felt like every time I hung out with her, she was like, Oh, I just closed another deal. And she had a very, very relaxed relationship with money. Like I remember, um, being at restaurants with her and she just pays. She's just like, Oh, just don't worry about it. Now there's more where that came from. And it was the first time I'd really witness someone have that comfortable of a relationship with themselves and with money, which I of course think are linked. Yeah. Um, even though my parents ended up pretty doing pretty well for themselves after immigrating, um, my mom still had that mindset of like needing to save and budget. And so even though I knew sometimes I could afford things, I would still struggle with spending um, until I met this person. And so she ended up, basically I complained to her that I didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Um, and we became really close. And so she said, why don't you become a realtor? And I was like, I don't know anything about that. I don't know how to do that. She's like, you don't need to know. She's like, I'm going to teach you. Don't yeah. worry. Um, and so I thought, okay, with that emotional safety in mind, I thought, you know what? I have nothing better to do anyways. I'm sure I'll make at least a little bit more money doing that than I will working at this shoe store. Yeah. And so I ended up going for it and I got my license and then I decided to start practicing. Um, and at that time, actually, between the time of her inspiring me to get into it and me actually obtaining my license, she became pregnant and gave birth to her daughter, and um, who's incredible. But she was basically, she took a bit of a break from real estate to focus on motherhood, obviously. And so then I was like, oh, well, then what am I going to do? And so I just remember really getting into like business at that point. I had never understood how to run a business. I didn't realize that when I became a realtor that I was now open for business. Um, I wasn't just someone, you know, I wasn't doing this as a hobby, right? This is an actual business with like, expenses and, you know, budgeting and, you know, advertisement costs. And so Um, That summer was a really intense year for me where I was just learning everything I could. And what's interesting is that I find that business and really growing to be the best level of yourself in business is a personal self-development journey, right? I truly believe that the most successful businesses have the people who've done the most inner work. Um, And the reason why so many businesses fail is not because the business structure or strategy was off. It was because the human was off. The human had work to do. Um, and so this kind of ramped up my spiritual development, personal development journey um, until I think I took it a little too far and I used spirituality as another means of perfecting myself, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Instead of actually really surrendering to the practices and accepting myself as I am, it was, oh, great, I'll just do this and I'll become like this intense meditator and I'm going to do all these practices and be like the self aware, healthy girl. And it was another mask I put on. And I hid behind that mask for a really long time um, until I finally pushed, 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 made it to the external goal that I wanted um, in real estate. I wanted to hit the top 10% in our city. Yeah, that's and, amazing. Uh, there's over four, yeah, there's yeah. over 14, 15,000 realtors. So mm-hmm. um, it was quite an accomplishment. And then I hit it and then I was like, I'm not happy. Yeah. What's, I was like, I got it and yeah. I don't feel any different. Mm-hmm. And so that was kind of uh, – 
when my dark night of the soul happened, where I was like, I'm not happy when I'm chasing these goals because I'm waiting to feel happy when I get there. And then I got there and I didn't even get to be happy. So what is the point? I was like, why do I do anything? And if you're at this point in your life, I'm so grateful and you should be so grateful because this is when it all begins. When you just start Mm -hmm. thinking, oh my God, nothing makes sense. Did I just do all of that for nothing? (laughs) Why do I even care? Why do I even, you know, when you start asking why, that's when your spirit starts almost talking back to you, you know, and you start uncovering and unpeeling back the layers and realizing like, oh, I did all of that so that I could feel safe and important. And, you know, sometimes you have to get it to realize it's not what you wanted or sometimes the complete opposite. It has to completely not work out for you to realize you're going to be okay too. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what got me into this journey. I didn't get it. I got into spirituality initially just because it was interesting. Like, oh, this is cool. And I took it on as my ego. And then what really took me deeper was just literally needing it needing to believe that my pain was for a purpose, needing to believe that this was going to lead me to become the version I was meant to be and eventually teach the lessons that were so hard for me. Um, and so that's what really took me really right, down the, the rabbit next hole. Level. Yeah. And at what point was level. that? And then it, yeah, how recent was that? That shit? Pretty recent. That was last year. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. And so things have happened really quickly because yeah. I have I think when you're truly in alignment, meaning that you're living from your true self, your heart, the version of you that would do what they wanted to do if they weren't scared, if they actually had the time and the money. When you start living from that place, things start happening very quickly. Um, Yeah, it's our resistance that makes that so difficult and delayed and arduous. Um, But yeah, that was only a year ago, a little less than a year ago. And is that around the time you started making TikTok videos? Yeah, I started making the TikTok videos. Yeah, no, I, I, my first manifestation video I released in December of 2021. Okay. Oh, so it's super recent. Yeah, but I actually, the first video that went viral, it only had about 2 million, but that still was, Mm -hmm. that was viral to me. My last video, like the most views I'd gotten was maybe 30,000. And I was like, oh my gosh, Um, which is still incredible. But um, that video was actually about um, capitalism. Mm. And doing nothing, which I think mm. is the first time we connected might have, online. That might have been the video, like how I found you. I, I don't right. remember, but I do remember that video about the book. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that was in August. So that um, that awakening was definitely one of the catalysts that really boosted my spiritual journey and awakening, um, realizing that I am so conditioned to believe that I have to earn my worth through productivity, I have to work hard in order to be successful. And I realized that once I started questioning this and once I started really rebelling against this, that that was actually a requirement in order for me to live my best and happiest life because it is not beneficial to capitalism for you to question these things. Um, And so it was really painful actually divorcing a lot of my self-worth from work. And to be honest, that's still an ongoing process. I know you've experienced a lot of this as well. Oh, definitely. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) It's a, yeah, it's an ongoing journey. It's, um, it's been, it's been difficult. I've realized even still just in the past couple of weeks that it's still so ingrained. Mm -hmm. Um, I tried to take two days of nothingness. I would create these blocks of four, six hours where I'm just, I'm just trying to walk or, you know, talk to a friend, not do anything work related. And anxiety will still come up sometimes because it doesn't feel safe to do nothing because I've been earning that worth for so long. Um, and so, yeah, that's about that that kind of got me here. I, (laughs) I know you're, I'm glad you told like all those details of your story because it shows how many twists and turns there really are in, in a, someone's journey. It's not so clean cut. Like it's not just one hump. Like you, you went through like so many loops and, and, but let's talk about, uh, I guess the thread that runs through everything. Cause starting from when you were a ballerina to you, you you kind of tied your worth and your identity to being a dancer first, and then it mm-hmm. became a student and then it became successful real estate agent. So let's, let's break that down because even yeah. though on the outside it might look like you're changing courses, like there is still that that thread that you're acting upon, like the thread, yeah. right? The identity of being a high achiever or being perfect or Definitely. productive. Um, yeah, talk about that. Let's break it down. 
Yeah, so definitely the decade between 18 and 28, that common theme was earn my worth through work. You know, feel secure through my achievements, um, earn respect and admiration through how I appear on the outside. And I real I, I kept thinking I was healing that as I moved to the next career, but mm-hmm. I was just basically supplanting it on a yeah, new it just thing. just keeps showing up like in different yes. forms. Yes. Yeah. And that's the thing. I find the that that happens keep... really often. Yeah. 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 And what well, happens in relationships too, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So the thing that you didn't heal in the last relationship, it's just going to come up in the next one and the next yeah. one until it becomes so painful that you're like, okay, maybe it's me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe it's, maybe it's not them, you know, maybe it's, um, maybe it is not the career. Maybe it's not the city. Maybe it's me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that common theme was definitely jumping around to career to career and city to different city, really trying to find a way to feel okay with myself. And as soon as one of the careers would dissolve or jobs would dissolve, then I would hurriedly rush to the next thing and figure out how am I going to earn my worth through it. And so actually between um, school and going into real estate, I had about a year, as you remember. So I took on a new identity of becoming a runner. Like I started that. <laughs> wow. I started that just to get exercise because I couldn't afford going to the gym. And then that was another way I earned my mm-hmm. worth where I couldn't feel good about myself unless I went on this run, you know, I and I would set up these arbitrary milestones for myself where if I don't run 15 miles this week, then like, you know, you're really going to, you're really going to be punished or something. You know, I don't know what the- uh, Let's talk about where these things come from. Cause I'm sure some listeners listening can relate to how you are. And so do you want to explore that? Share that. Oh yeah. You want, you want to go down that route? Okay. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Because that's part of it. It's being aware of where it came from in the first place. Yeah, well, that definitely came a lot later. Um, the awareness, because that's what that's what healing is, right? Mm-hmm. Is bringing the awareness. So before you have the awareness, you just you don't know why you're doing it. You just yeah. you just are. You just think that's how you are. You just think that's how you are. I just thought I was a high achieving, um, go getter, ambitious person, and a lot of this is so valued in our society that I didn't even think to question it. I was like, no, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. It was only when I reached a lot of my goals that I was like, that didn't work. But I mean, it definitely came from growing up in an Asian household where you know you were expected to do really excellent things. It was almost like your payback for how much your parents had sacrificed for you. Um, And that is both unconscious and conscious, right? It's suggested in the speech and the body language and the culture, but it's also just verbally communicated to you as well. Yeah. (laughs) You know, you have these expectations, you have to achieve this and this. Well, yes. And then also Mm -hmm. it's like, do you know how good you have it? Do you know how lucky you are? You know, your dad and I didn't have these things. Um, They've relaxed and eased up a lot now, but you know, my dad grew up in a trailer park. And so my mom would think like, oh, well, you guys just grew up in this, you know, you know, two story house and you have everything you ever need. And so there was definitely a part of me that thought, yeah, I mean, you're right. I, you're right. I need to prove that like I was worth it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so Mm -hmm. it started there. It started so early. And so that theme followed me for not just the 10 years between 18, 28, but really starting at probably six, seven, eight. Um, And then that was kind of what started the ballet identity that I created. And then that just continued onwards. Um, And then obviously into real estate, it was how do I be the best? How do I become the best, the fastest? Mm -hmm. Um, I reached the top 10% in under two years. And I was a complete stranger to the city. I had no sphere of influence. Um, Actually, when you start in real estate, any mentor will tell you, well, you start with your sphere of influence. You reach out to your friends and family and let them know that you're transitioning into real estate and you'd love to help, you know, maybe give them a discount. And I was like, I don't have a sphere of influence. I don't know anyone here. Um, And any of the friends I did know, I wouldn't even trust them to use me at that point because I just started. So I didn't know what I was doing. Um, And so, yeah, there was this pressure on myself that no one else was putting on me. Of course, it was coming from internally where I thought I have to figure out how to, you know, do the most amount of deals that I possibly can, you know, get into the top 10% so that finally when I do that, I'll feel comfortable and safe and good. And then I think I just did that enough times where finally I did get there last year. And I was like, I just don't think I'm doing this right. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I started questioning and then, yeah, that's really what led me to here. So I'd say the common theme was definitely that needing to earn my worth, needing, mm-hmm. using perfectionism as my barometer for how well I was doing in life and using other people's comments and statements and judgments to discern whether I was on the right track um, until being on that right track didn't lead me to what was true fulfillment and happiness. And so learning to really abandon that and fearfully and courageously just go after the life of my dreams and know that that is going to lead to happiness, not any external goal. Right. So how have you shifted? What do you focus on now? What do I focus on now? Um, Does this add value to my life and would it add value to someone else's life? I think those are the two requirements for me to do anything. You know, this podcast, does it add value to my life? Yes. It's a hell yes. I love Mm -hmm. having this conversation, um, sharing energy with you. And then it adds value to other people because people are going to listen and maybe hear something that resonates with them. And it's going to maybe create that shift, that ripple. And so with my previous forms of work, um, there was not always value to other people. But more importantly, there wasn't even any value to myself. It was just the thing that I was doing in order to feel safe, Um, which is by and large an illusion, right? You come into this world and you're already all in. There's no dress rehearsal. There's no second chances. And so I thought if I'm all in, then why not go all in on my dreams? So that took me such a long time because we believe that having a certain job or making a certain amount of money is going to make us feel safe. And then in doing that, I am amazed at how many people waste time, which is a non-renewable resource, you know, suffer mental health, and then sometimes eventually physical health mm-hmm. and call that safe. Right, right. And I'm realizing, I don't think that's safe, guys, you know, for me to... <laughs> You know, you're sacrificing your entire life and your body, your mind, everything, your body, your mind Mm -hmm. and your spirit. You know, when we starve ourselves of creativity and joy um, and positivity, we, we honestly, we start to shrivel up and, Mm -hmm. and die and become, you become depressed. It's, it's really no surprise to me that I think we're the most depressed we've ever been in history. Right. I think I read that statistic recently. You know, that's not a surprise when we live in this hush, hustle post-industrialist culture that's teaching you, yeah, you're nothing until you produce something. Um, and you're invaluable until you produce, you know, something of, you know, a material good. And so I thought, how can I actually create value in myself? And then how can I give that to others? That was the huge shift for me. Yeah. This is similar to something else I wanted you to talk about was the concept of like invisible, invisible assets. You have a video about that and, and why, like you said, like taking the safe route is not safe. Can you go into that? It's not safe. Yeah. So we don't often consider the difference or really the existence of invisible assets. We learn to value visible assets throughout our life, which would be, of course, your job, your amount of income, maybe your house, your car, you know, those are visible assets. And we talk about keeping up with the Joneses. We're keeping up with their visible assets, right? Mm -hmm. They got a car. Oh, now I got to get a car. They put up a fence. Now I got to put up a fence, right? And we do that in so many funny, um, quirky ways, but we are completely foregoing in the name of those visible assets are invisible ones, which are your peace, your happiness, your your sense of purpose, your creativity, your joy, your connection, your purpose. We sacrifice all of these in the name of those visible assets. And I'm realizing that for me is not enough to call myself successful Mm -hmm. because I actually had a lot of really incredible visible assets. You know, someone might look at me from the outside and think, oh, she lives by the water in Vancouver and she drives a nice car and, you know, she sells these million dollar houses and all of those were objectively true, but I wasn't successful at all. Yeah. Not on the inside at least. Yeah. Yeah. And true success is when the inside matches the outside. Exactly. Exactly. And and actually when the inside matches the outside, that's when you start manifesting like crazy. Mm -hmm. What takes so long is fighting through and ignoring the inside and trying to go from the outside in. Along that vein, I want to talk to you about manifestation because a lot of people, when they talk about manifesting, they talk about like the physical things first because people usually want to manifest physical things. So yeah. do you advise starting with that and then going into, inv- or like, what is your thought? 
on great question. So mm-hmm. definitely not. That is actually coming at it from the wrong direction. Yeah. It's so backwards, but you have to go the opposite way. And we can actually use the framework of invisible assets, invisible assets to talk about this because when you are reaching for a physical manifestation, you are essentially um you're essentially craving a visible asset, right? You're saying, oh, when I get that job, I'll feel better. Or when I get that partner, when I get that money. And you are completely sacrificing your invisible assets, so your sense of happiness in the pursuit of that. And so you're in opposition to what you actually want to experience and call in. And so I actually get my clients whenever they want to manifest something to really connect with what is that going to feel like? What invisible asset is that actually going to grant you? What do we think we would get to achieve and attain invisibly if we had the visible thing? And then usually it's very similar answers for everyone. I'd feel happy. I'd I'd feel calm. I'd feel, honestly, a lot of them just say relieved. Uh They're like, I think I would feel relieved because they're doing all this stuff in order to get that thing. And it's stressful. Your nervous Mm -hmm. system is is hijacked, right? And I'm like, okay, and now you're going to do that first before you call this in. And yeah. you're like, no, I can't. <laughs> I want it first, right? Yeah, yeah. And so if we are still wanting something so badly, we are in lack. We're essentially saying, I don't have it and I feel terrible and I won't feel good until I have it. But what happens, the negative side of that, the darker shadow side of that is if you do get it, of course, you're going to get that dopamine hit. You're going to get that serotonin. And then the shadow side is now that you've achieved it, you've outsourced your sense of happiness and confidence and security onto it. Now you're going to want to keep chasing it. You need more. Yeah. And so it's not enough actually to reach that financial goal you had or you know that career. There's always now a next goal actually- and a next one and it never yes. ends. So it's let's never talk about ending. Let's let's talk about breaking that cycle. Like how when yeah, is it enough? So, that, so feeling as if it's already happened. Just just and usually it's like very simple emotions. Like I feel peaceful. I I feel joyful. I feel proud of myself. Things like that, which you can yeah, already well, start think- feeling now. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. And emotions are simple. When we think emotions are complicated, it's because we're confusing thoughts with emotions. Mm -hmm. We'll say things like, I feel so accomplished. That's not an emotion, Mm -hmm. right? The adjective accomplished or that word or that, you know, state of being is really being, you have to identify what actually do I feel when I think I'm accomplished? Is it grateful? Is it happy? Is it calm? Um, And so it's not that you're accomplished or that you're confused. It's that you're usually happy or um, in disgust or fear or anxiety. And so I think there's really only six, I think it's six major emotions. And then there's obviously shades. Like anger can be anywhere between, you know, irritation and violence but it's anger overall. And so I think we only have those six. And so, yeah, these emotions are all available to us now. It is, the suffering is actually experienced when we believe that an emotion is only accessible once we have the thing. That's Mm -hmm. what causes so much suffering because all you do is think every day, all day, what you want. And then you look around in your physical environment and it's not there. And so you're signaling to yourself, I don't get to feel that because it's not here. And then in doing that, you keep pushing it further away. That's the ironic thing. You think focusing on it is going to bring it in, but you're actually pushing it out. And so it's really getting people to consciously rewire and feel those emotions in the present, which is the only place you can feel them because it's the only place we are, right? Waiting to redeem that feeling in the future is just constantly putting it off because there's always more future. For as long as you're alive, there's another day ahead of you. And so then you're just constantly chasing, chasing, chasing. And so really getting them to sit with their emotions in the present and start feeling that now, you know, embodying as if. Um, I talk about the law of assumption a lot in my work where we just, we literally assume and we joke about being delusional. You know, be delusional. Imagine that you do have this graphic graphic design business. Imagine that you are a TEDx speaker. Why not? Who is this hurting? And when you do that, stop and drop in. How does that make you feel? And then usually they'll say, oh, I feel, I feel really good. I actually like, I don't know. I don't feel anxious anymore. And I'm like, great. You're quantum leaping. You're literally matching the energy of your desire right now. And now you have made it that much easier for that timeline to align with you and then come into your awareness and be experienced as 3D reality. That's how we manifest. 
right? But people think, oh no, I have to push, push, push and do all this action, action, action in order to get the thing. And if anyone listens to Abraham Hicks, she talks about how doing that is like vacuuming your entire house without having plugged in the vacuum. (laughs) You're just running around and wasting energy and burning out. And so that alignment piece is really plugging yourself and connecting with that emotion, you know, flooding your body with that sensation now, and then leading yourself forward from that place. Actually, life will lead you you'll naturally feel inspired to do certain things. And so I'm sure that's how your journey has felt. And it's just felt like a constant, you know, almost breadcrumb following once you connected with your joy and your purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that how you live life now? Because there's a difference between like the striving that we probably used to do versus just like embodying that emotion and then things start, start coming to you. Right. Do you notice yeah, that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I don't want anyone to think that, I just always live my life in like pure embodiment and I just manifest everything so quickly. I do manifest a lot of things quickly because I am aware of this, but I still struggle with that pushing, pushing, pushing action. Mm -hmm. And then it usually will go on for, at this point, it will only go on for about two weeks before I I catch it. And then I'm like, "Mm, I did it again. And being able to have compassion for myself because that was a really strong pattern that Mm -hmm. I was constantly strengthening year over year, day by day. And so when I notice it, I just almost like you're telling a child like, oh, not supposed to do that. Okay. We're going to put that away now. Instead of, you know, yelling at them and putting them in timeout, I'm just bringing awareness to it in a gentle, loving way. Like, oh, okay, Sam, like you just started hindering your self-worth again on how many things you could get off the to-do list. Like how can we kind of flow through this a bit more? Um, Which makes me actually think about the polarity of manifesting in terms of masculine and feminine. I know you didn't ask about that, but I feel like going into it. Go for it. Um, But a lot of us in our hustle culture, we're very masculine, right? It's about structure and planning and execution. You know, think about a corporation. That's a very masculine energy. Um, And especially with women, we've lost a lot of our femininity and coming into the workplace, which is amazing. You know, we now have financial independence. We don't have to rely on men anymore to go to work for us, but we've lost a lot of that feminine connection. But when it comes to manifesting, you can't just constantly take actions. There's a balance. Mm -hmm. And so the feminine side of manifesting is that dreaming, that idealizing, right? That subconscious realm, those emotions, that's all very feminine. And so if we're not connected to that, then all the action in the world is not going to produce a very good result or will delay our results. And so I definitely spend a lot of time kind of flowing back and forth. And I think we need that no matter what you're trying to do in life, um, that balance between masculinity, that constant planning and executing, doing it all, being a girl boss, right? And then moving into the feminine too, which is, you know, not girl bossy, but it's just, it's like intuitive being just, Mm -hmm. you know, living in the emotions and spirit of your manifestation because they exist in both forms. Right. Right. This reminds me of like when people talk about manifesting with the moon phases, there's actually like Mm. two weeks where it's about taking action. And then the other two weeks is just taking a step back and letting things come. And it's all about like releasing and letting go. So yeah, I think the talking about that balance is is really important. It's not just all hustle, hustle, action, action. Definitely. Nor is it just doing nothing, (laughs) you know? It's a balance of both. Yeah. It's both. And I think that is the thing too. After doing something, 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 you get burnt out and you're like, okay, I guess I'll do nothing. nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And then you just end up, you know, doing nothing and And then going back and doing that. Yeah. It's okay in that moment because you probably need it. I think because, because we, we both read the book, do nothing, which I I really enjoyed. I feel like the past year was like my do less. I've been trying to do less for the longest time (laughs) because for a very long time in my life, I was so ambitious and I did, I was about doing more, being more productive. And I think if you've been living this way for so long, or if you've been burning yourself out for this long, you do have to do nothing to balance everything out. Yeah. Yeah. For a long time. (laughs) Yeah. I actually um, just want to say I loved witnessing that journey um, of yours because it was so parallel to mine. And Mm -hmm. yeah, that doing less, it really is such a rebellion. But once you're rested, it's time to get back to work, but in a balanced way. In a balanced way. 
And yeah, and not like, oh, I've done nothing for so long. Now I need to just, you know, go, go, go again, which a lot of people do. I know that a lot of people coming out of the pandemic, right? A lot of them are laid off. And so they did nothing, Mm -hmm. you know, not of their own accord. But then once, you know, things started kind of coming back to normal, they're like, okay, now I got to, you know, build up the business and do all this stuff. I think the difference (laughs) is like, it's, it's all the invisible things. The difference is like releasing that guilt or that anxiety that you have around Mm -hmm. like doing work or, or not doing work. I think before, if I was doing nothing, you feel guilty and you feel anxious that you're not doing anything. And then it's, it's really like shifting your mind to, learn to nurture yourself and it's, it's okay to be, to do nothing and to relax. Like nature is relaxed and things still get done. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I've been actually trying to embody moving at the speed of nature more than I do at the speed of technology. Ooh, I love that. Yeah. I actually heard it was Sahara Rose that said that. And I thought when I heard it, something in me just was like a full stop. Yeah. I thought I am living at the speed of technology, Mm -hmm. which is not my nature. You know, you're not a robot. You are nature. I think a lot of us forget that we separate ourselves as humans from the natural world as if we're not a part of it. You know, you just put up four walls and a roof and you're separate, which is the greatest lie there ever was. You're the whole thing. You are literally of the universe. And actually realizing that in a powerful way, help me manifest so much because I thought I'm made of the same stuff as all of this. Yeah. Why could I not create that? Exactly. Love Why that. Could I, how is it possible that I can't create my reality when the world created me and everything <laughs> else I see in it? Yeah. Yeah. That perspective was a huge shift for me. Love that. Um, I, I also want you to talk about this journey of letting go of the need to constantly improve because self-improvement, personal growth, like people get into it because yeah, it's good to like improve, but it can be taken to the extreme or it can be based on your ego or your self-worth. Um, let's talk about that. Yeah, I definitely think that um, untying your self-worth to how much you work and how much you achieve really begins with inner child healing, which is, I think, becoming a lot more mainstream. And I'm so grateful because all of us have a really damaged, broken, scared child inside of us that is doing everything they possibly can to make themselves feel safe. And that's going to manifest in different ways. For a lot of us, it does manifest as work. Um, And what keeps us from questioning for so long is that constant rewarding of it in the culture, right? But we also deal with that in really quote unquote negative ways, you know, people will deal with that through drug abuse, um, any substance abuse, um, through their relationships. So it really begins when you start to uncover, okay, what part of me learned that I wouldn't feel safe unless I did all this stuff. And it's going to take a little while, right? It's, it's uncomfortable at first and awkward kind of communing with that inner part of you. But maybe it's going into a deep meditation or having a conversation with someone from your past and realizing, oh, when I was 13, my mom was vividly angry with me because I didn't get these awards at school for like my grades. I'll never forget, I had an award ceremony where they basically awarded the top 10 students of every class and subject. And I got one, I got the English award. And I remember getting into the car and being like, she was, she was mad. I remember wow. after um, actually getting up from the audience, looking around and scanning to see my mom, she was not there. And all of the other parents were reuniting with their kids and being like, congratulations, even to the ones who didn't like get anything. Um, they were graduating, congratulating them. And then I got into my car and um, my mom did not say a word. And on the way home, I said, at least I got one nothing, nothing. And then we get home and she pulls into the driveway and then I start to walk inside and she's like, you stay out here. And I'm like, okay, weird. And then she comes out and she has this huge stack of glass plates and just literally starts (gasps) hurling them at the ground. Oh my God. And just sheer anger, a literal tantrum. And so in that moment, I went into like a freeze yeah. nervous system response. I was like, I don't know what's ha- I'm so sc- oh, what's ha- I- She's so mad. And then I eventually shifted into what I now recognize as the flight nervous system response, which was how can I get away from this feeling, which I started, um, which I started nurturing through like doing, doing, doing. Mm. And I didn't know that's where it started until oh I did gosh. a really deep hypnosis actually last year, mm-hmm. two years ago, 
two years ago, I did really deep hypnosis and uncovered this because this was like a memory I just completely had blacked out. Mm. And it was such a core memory. I was yeah. so scared. Yeah. And so I learned in that moment, unconsciously, I associated, okay, never do that again. Wow. You know, never don't achieve. If you don't achieve, your mom will be upset with you. And that would mean fear. That would danger, literally danger. And, you know, to the logical mind, the reason why healing can be so difficult is you might recall a memory and think, oh, but that's so long ago. Like, who cares? You know, that didn't mean anything. And you might even try to defend your mom. I did that too, where I was like, oh, she was just, you know, she was just stressed and in a bad mood. But then I'm not honoring the part of me that literally thought of that threat. My nervous system thought that Mm -hmm. was a tiger. Yeah. Right. It didn't know that this was just, you know, some stupid seventh grade award ceremony to the body. I was actually in the face of a perceived threat. And so I learned early on unconsciously, okay, we're never, ever going to let that happen again. We are going to achieve every possible achievement we possibly can. Mm. And as a way of safety. Yeah. As a way of safety. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. I mean, it's, I mean, not what happened to you, but it's to like recognize that, especially if it was like a blacked out memory, like that's, that's so healing to be able to reach that point. Yeah. And I think inner child healing is really daunting for so many people because they're a bit afraid of what they're going to uncover. Right. But go into that, right? Because whatever you are scared to uncover has been suppressed, Mm -hmm. right? Because you becoming aware of it is actually its release. It's a sign that it's leaving the body now. Um, It's leaving your awareness. And so you will actually start to unearth things and recall certain memories. And you might think, oh, no, no, this is coming up and I don't want it. I don't want this. I don't want to experience this again. But no, it's coming up because you're recognizing it. It's trying to be released now. It's been suppressed for so long. Um, Yeah. And that leads to a lot of not just mental health issues, but a lot of physical issues. Um, I actually, I don't know if you do acupuncture. I personally haven't, but my boyfriend has. (gasps) Like, yeah. Okay. So I actually started doing acupuncture last year and I honestly, I was pretty open to a lot of different modalities, but I thought, what? You're just going to stick a bunch of needles in me and then I'm going to be good to go. I I do want to try it soon. You should. Yeah. Um, definitely finding a good one is important, but I actually had some benefits I hadn't used up at the end of last year. And I thought, ah, oh, what the heck? I'll go to um, acupuncture. And, um, you know, the memories that we store are not only stored in our minds, but in our bodies, right? And so when I did acupuncture, I actually told her that I had a lot of hip problems. Um, and so she was like, okay, like what, what's your activity like? And all of that. And I thought, I don't really have a lot of crazy activity. I was like, I work out in a healthy, you know, moderate way. I'm not so intense as like I used to be. Um, and I just couldn't explain why I had all this hip pain. And so this is how I learned all of this healing is interconnected and how the body stores memories and things like that. And, um, she started putting all of these needles like around my legs and feet and then my hips. And then she pulled up my shirt and she actually saw this scar that I have on my hip, which I often forget about. And she was like, oh my gosh, what happened here? Is this big, long scar on my hip bone. And I was like, oh, that was from this, um, like, like scooter accident when I was like, like nine or 10 years old. Yeah. We like hit the pavement and then, um, I scraped, I scraped myself and it would like went all the way down to the tendon. And she was like, Oh my "Oh my gosh. Like she was, she was so shocked. And I was like, Oh, it's no big deal though. I mean, like it doesn't hurt or anything. And she was like, that is hugely traumatic to your body. And I was like, oh, interesting. I hadn't really thought about it that way. I was like, yeah, I mean, it was, but I'm fine. And then she went to go put a needle in the scar and my whole body convulsed and I immediately started crying. And I was like, what's happening? And she was like, you're, it's okay. She was like, it's okay. You're releasing all of the trauma that was stored at that that time from that accident. And so I was like, whoa, like I never, and then my hip actually started feeling way better after this. Mm, Yeah. And I was like, okay, so was it that I wasn't taking care of my hips or that there was this traumatic experience that was literally manifesting in physical pain in my body now. Yeah. And so that's the thing. A lot of us look at our life now and we're like, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong. You know, we look at our life and you might even think, I have everything I need, but I don't feel happy. It's because there's something that's been suppressed. Right. There's like a you trauma. You haven't dealt that with it. To- 
Or especially like you might've had the mindset like, oh, it's not a big deal. I'm fine. I'm strong. And, and that's pushing exactly. down the emotion of pain. And exactly. It's, and yeah. who, exactly. And who did you have to be strong for? You know, when did you learn that being mm-hmm. strong was good? Yeah. You probably as a child were crying and then someone told you to stop that. Yeah. Right? I feel like most men have this issue. <laughs> Yes, right? they, they push so many emotions down because they want to be strong and downplay the the pain or the you know just everything. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, every being, even a man, if he has a lot of masculine energy, needs to also tap into that balance of that polarity. Like I talked right, about, he needs right. the feminine too. Um, and so, yeah, we suppress all of this, and it becomes lodged in our body and can be experienced as physical pain, but also mental pain. You know, like the like, fog and confusion and, you know, depression and all of that. And so, you know, I'm not saying don't take prescription medication for that. I think that has a time and a place, but that is going to be actually doubly more effective, I think, with accompanied with the inner work and releasing all of these things. Um, And it's, it's, hard. It's scary. You know, you learned as a kid, it was not okay to cry. And then maybe you cried when you were a teenager and someone told you you were being dramatic and you need to just get over it. And so, you know, when you do start healing, and I think you went through this too, Eileen, you, you think you're almost like losing it. You're like, we, I remember you went to, I think you went to Bali I and did, yeah. everything just, yeah. And you yeah. had that experience of release Mm-hmm. where everything was just coming out and you're just crying for yeah. days yeah. and feeling the worst you ever have and literally questioning everything. And you're also identifying with that state too. So you're like, oh my God, what's happening to me? Like things are getting worse, mm-hmm. but no, things are actually falling away so that things yeah. can get better. Yeah. And so I love when people reach you know, rock bottoms or metaphorical ones because I'm like, this is it. You yeah. are literally about to shift into a completely new reality. Good. Yeah. Be scared. You're fine. You're going to be okay. Um, like and now that's I'm something. so excited when things come up, even though physically yeah. I'm crying and I'm like, I'm feeling the emotions of like childhood traumas. Like I'm excited because it's like, oh my God, I discovered something new. Like, like I think healing is a never ending journey. There's always like these little, you know, the, yes, I think you heal the big things first. And then beyond that, there's so many like little things that kind of got lost in the cracks and crevices in your body. And you don't realize it until you get there and the memories come up and then, and then you deal with it. Right. But I, to me, it's, I think if you shift your framework, like mind, I guess, mindset, like it's exciting and interesting because there's so much to uncover in me. Yeah. There's so, yeah. So I well, think people yeah. are scared of the emotion, but don't, I, I think the trick is not identifying with the emotion. Like just see it as something that is living in your body and let it come up and out through you. And and that's it. It's just an energy, right? It's you just, just an want to release that energy. Yeah. I think of them as like unwelcome guests. I'm like, it's time for you to go. <laughs> yeah, It's time yeah. for you to go. And yeah. it might be painful as they're leaving because they might be like, I don't want to go. Exactly. Right. And you're like, well, it's time for you to go. And mm-hmm. I think that when we start approaching healing, I think um, what keeps us from it is that fear approach, right? Oh my gosh, all my, all this stuff is going to come up. It's going to be so painful and it's going to be so scary. And then you're right. It does require that perspective shift into love, which is, mm-hmm. oh my God, what am I going to uncover about myself? Mm-hmm. What is this going to unlock for me? How am I going to now expand into the highest being and version of myself through this pain, through yeah. this release? Because I just imagine it's all like baggage weighing you down. And the more you can let it go one by one, the more free you'll feel and the more authentic you can be. So it's actually really relieving. It's like, imagine your whole life, you're like holding like a bag of rocks and then healing is like one by one, like (laughs) realizing they're there and like just tossing it out. You just literally feel just tossing it off. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, when people say, I feel so free, you know, I feel so like myself lately, what is that actual feeling? It's lightness, mm. Right. The word free, free is not an emotion, right? It's an adjective. Mm-hmm. But what are we associating with that? It's that like just, you know, you're, you're just like yeah. on air. Like you feel like you have joy. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. And that really comes when you just release what's no longer serving you. But a lot of us, how do we try to get that feeling? We try to add Oh, which yeah, is you're so right. counterintuitive. We're like, I yeah. need to add money. I need to oh, add relationship. So right. Yeah. Yeah. I need to add mm-hmm. accolades. I need to, and you're just like, no, you don't need to add anything. It's about letting you it go. Let yeah. it go. And then, and then you'll feel the it, emotion. Exactly. But unfortunately, yeah. if you have identified with everything you've added, it's going to be really hard to let it go because you think that's you. 
And so if you let it, if you, you know, let go of the career or, you know, you take a step back in relationships, you're like, if you feel like a part of you is dying and you're like, no, you're just becoming aware of what's actually not you at all so that you can do this releasing and then really connect with who am I without all of that? You know, who am I without any condition, without any limits, without any fears? I've stripped myself completely. Now, what do I want? Yeah, that's love I think it. the journey. <laughs> that's that's a great place to be. Um, last thing is, I do want you to touch on you. You have this perspective on like the way you view your parents. You, you call it like the, the yes and framework. And I think it's important to to bring that up because when we talk about inner child healing, and everyone has traumas, right? And we often blame our parents for certain things. Um, but but I want you to bring in this perspective. I think it'll be a good way to end the podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that yes and both and framework is so important because it is the either or that really keeps us from recognizing all the parts of us and all the nuances of our experience. And so with the inner child healing with respect to your parents and where why that would be so important is if you are looking to release what's no longer serving you and heal those parts of you. I mean, remember my story when I was 13 and I was traumatized in the garage. My mom was crashing these plates. I can't actually heal and feel and release that without acknowledging how scary it was. But if I live within the either or framework, then for me to acknowledge how scary that would be, oh, then that would mean my mom was bad. My mom didn't love me. And I don't believe that. So in order to protect the vision and the role and within my mind of how my mom was, I will not look at my stuff because I had a good mom. My mom was good to me. You know, my mom didn't do anything bad. And so, and she did everything she obviously did out of love. And I know that now. And so, but in order for me to heal, I had to acknowledge, okay, my mom was amazing and still is, and has provided me every single opportunity and, you know, option for me to succeed and has loved me and supported me. And she projected unconscious, unresolved trauma onto me and didn't know how to regulate emotions, which led to me having that experience that put me into a fear state for so many years. And I have to acknowledge both of those because if I don't, I either demonize my parents, right? Which is what some people are doing now, Mm -hmm. or I suppress myself. Right. And neither of these lead to that sense of freedom, Mm -hmm. that sense of wholeness. And so it has been doing the, the both and that has allowed me to look back at all of these parts. Um, Also acknowledging too, I think in order to move forward and really grow, we have to look back and see, yes, that was painful. And it was what led me to the next catalyst or it Mm -hmm. was the catalyst. Mm -hmm. I think we have to have both of those in order to really grow. If I look at this past experience and I just think of it in the negative way, I can't believe that happened to me. That shouldn't have happened to me. That was the worst thing that could have ever happened. That ruined my life. And I don't, incorporate the both and framework, I don't see the light in that, the purpose in that, then that's also not going to lead to a sense of freedom and fulfillment. Mm -hmm. I love that so much because I think people tend to have like a black and white view on things and this helps integrate it because people are complex beings, even your parents, and it's okay for them to have, it's okay to have both. Like they were, they could be great parents. They could be loving and have caused you trauma in th- those specific moments. Like yes. it both can exist and that's okay. Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, even parents need to adopt that framework with their children. Like, yes, my kid is having the worst tantrum of their entire life. And I literally want to shove them in a closet and, you know, they are deserving of my love yeah. and attention yeah. and empathy right now. Right. But if they don't have that framework, then, oh, you're a bad kid right? And then you get that projected onto you and then you internalize that and then you actually believe you are a bad kid. And that's going to lead you either one of two ways. Either you you um, succumb to that badness and then you become like that sort of rebel black sheep of the family. Or you're like, oh, I don't want to be the bad kid. So I'm just going to constantly strive, strive, strive and become the golden right. child. Right. Right. Yeah. And usually in a family with more than one sibling, there's always one, there's always mm-hmm. both. There's one black sheep, yeah. there's one golden child. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, and that's that is happening because we are in such a black and white form of thinking. And even with ourselves, you know, I think we need to have that framework of when we make a mistake, you know, when we mm-hmm. falter. Like, yes, I did make a mistake and I'm growing, I'm learning. Yeah. So, we need it in all the areas of our life, I think. 
Love it. Do you have any last words of advice you want to share with our listeners? Yeah. Um, I want you to know that living your most wildly authentic dream life is going to be an act of rebellion. You are going to experience judgments and opinions and fear and anxiety as you come up against all of these old lies and frameworks that you are releasing. And I want you to know that there is so much amazing joy and manifestations, all the ones that you can imagine on the other side of this. And so if you're going through that, just keep going. There's more. There's so much more. Um, Where you are now has nothing to do with where you're going to be. And so the emotion you're currently experiencing is not forever. It's a circle. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you're in a good spot right now, that's going to change too. (laughs) It's a never ending. (laughs) It's a never ending spiral, like you said. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my motto is spiraling higher. Yeah. I think that's, that's what life is about. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, lastly, where can we find you online? Yeah. So you can find me on TikTok where most people follow me or Instagram where I'm actually a bit more active at simplifying Sam, um, sorry, simplifying dot Sam. Um, and if you are interested in being coached by me, I have a couple of different ways you can work with me. I'm actually in the middle of about to launch my group coaching program called massive manifestation. It's 12 weeks of juicy content. We coach live every week. And, um, also I have one-on-one coaching availability as well. So those links are are in my link tree on both Instagram and TikTok. So if you're interested, um, definitely drop in there. And if you like this episode, I would love to hear it from you. And I'm sure Eileen would too. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. I'll leave all those links in the show notes. Definitely check her out, simplifying.sam. And I just had so much fun. Thank you for coming on the podcast. Yeah. Thank you so much. This was such a fun thing for me to co-create and it was an honor um, sharing my journey with you. 